everyone. Happy Easter to those who celebrate it. I guess those who really celebrate it aren't here. Um, before I get started, let me tell you about my superpower, and I use that in quotes. When I use certain software for the first time, I almost always find some bug that results in me wasting time trying to fix it and needing help from some expert. Yes, I know, it's a very lame superpower. Um, but uh, at least I've, I leave a, a trail of, um, <clears throat> of known software bugs in my wake. Like this screen behind me, it needs my avatar name so that I can control it. It would not work for me until it was discovered that my avatar name was too long. I had to change my avatar name. I mean, it was uh, many thanks to Tagline. Tagline spent a lot of time helping me, Durlanda a bit as well. Also thanks to Chantel who invited me to speak. I've been wanting to try this. In fact, I've been preparing a presentation on celestial orbits, and I normally take months to do it. Um, so that one won't be ready for a few months yet. I still have much to learn. And then last Sunday, Chantel invited me to speak about the moon on Easter. What, seven days to prepare? No, she said I have a choice. I can speak on Friday or Saturday, so that's five or six days instead of seven. Just peachy. But it's um, it's Holy Week for in a number of countries, including Mexico, Semana Santa. So yes, uh, there's there are fewer dis, um, distractions, so I was able to do this. It required much cutting and pasting from the internet, uh, mostly Wikipedia's articles about the moon. No diagrams of my own here. And I am grateful for this opportunity to speak, so uh, even though I'll be saying things like, if I had more time, I could have done this or that, I'm actually not complaining. I'm really advertising my next presentation. If you think this presentation is great, then you'll really love my next one, especially because I have more time for that one. <clears throat> so talking about the moon on Easter is appropriate, given that Easter Sunday is defined as the first Sunday after the first full moon of spring, and I'll be talking a bit about, about that later on. Also, there are more than 100 moons in our solar system, and so I wanted to be very specific by using a name for the one I'm talking about. So I used the Latin name, um, <clears throat> Luna, which is also, coincidentally, the uh, Spanish name for the moon. But I, I could have used its Greek name, like I could say, Selene, Earth's moon, which is... Uh, the Greek goddess of the moon in Greek mythology. Uh, I should point out, I'm not an expert on the moon. I'm not a selenologist. I'm really an interstellar matter kind of guy. Uh, I specialize in observing molecular clouds in nearby galaxies. My name is William Wall. I'm a researcher at the National Institute of Astrophysics, Optics, Electronics in Tonicimpla, Puebla, Mexico. Here's a picture of me in... Uh, in Cypress Falls Park in West Vancouver. My wife took this picture of me last year. And as you can see, my shirt has a fresh set of batteries because it's glowing nicely, a nice healthy green color. You see it from Columbus. Um, here is the large millimeter telescope, Alfonso Serrano. This is about a two hour drive from our, uh, our institute. It's the largest telescope of its kind. Build aperture, 50 meter aperture, um, for observing at wavelengths of 1 to 4 millimeters, for observing molecular lines in the interstellar medium. Um, <clears throat> it's on Sierra Negra, which is a uh, uh, dormant volcano or extinct? Oops, it's an extinct volcano, but I think it's dormant. It's next to a dormant volcano as well. Um, <clears throat> this has an adaptive surface so that the primary surface actually has uh, panels that. Uh, can be reshaped to um, compensate for uh, distortions in the back structure. <clears throat> so it maintains this parabolic shape. Um, and uh, <clears throat> it was an element in the Event Horizon Telescope that imaged the black hole in the galaxy M87. And no, I'm not part of that collaboration. So getting on to the moon, here's a photo of the near side of the moon and the far side of the moon. This, I believe, was taken with the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, the LRO. And you can see, <clears throat> let's see, one side is permanently fixed towards us. This is the near side, and this is away from us with a thicker crust. Here you see thin areas of, of the lunar crust. They're called the lunar seas, the maria, mare. And why the moon has two different faces like this. One, one, and why one side is locked towards the Earth 
is because of tidal locking, and I'll t discuss that later. I mean, this whole topic is far too vast to do it justice in only one hour. You really need full-length courses, uh, including lunar geology, lunar missions, and maybe even on the lunar orbit itself. So today, I'm only going to touch on certain highlights that I consider to be important, or that I consider to be the most interesting, from my point of view. This is the uh, basic outline. Start with a motivation, why the subject is interesting, lunar basics, basic details, formation and structure of the moon, moon's orbit about the Earth, missions to the moon. I won't talk much about these. There have just been so many. So I'll just point out how many they've been. There have been. It's just really impressive. The future of humanity in the moon. And here's a really cool photo of the moon. I like this because right there, that little dot right there, which I'll move this out of the way, but, you know, that little dot, that's the International Space Station, which is orbiting the Earth, not the Moon, but it uh, is passed in front of the Moon. Another interesting thing to notice is that these Mare, at this particular orient, Mare Serenitatis, Sunditatis, Tranquilitatis, you can almost use that like a, the hands of a clock almost see so it's pointing sort of at two o'clock you have to add two so it's like four in the morning and check here oh it's four in the morning okay let's sort of use this as a clock anyway let's check is the far side hit by more meteors oh yeah i like the jokes i'm coming to the jokes as a matter of fact yeah um so i decided to build a restaurant on the moon the food is great but there's no atmosphere and how does the man in the moon cut his hair eclipse it that was from a nine-year-old child. Anyway, um, <clears throat> I, the point I'm making there is that the moon has been a, a part of our culture for a long time, and there are a number of things that we've done uh, because of the moon, inspired by the moon, including including um, <clears throat> jokes, great jokes and bad jokes, too. Okay, um, yeah, the near side does look more interesting. Is the far side hit by more meteors? Uh, I don't think so. I think it's, I think it's the same. Um, it's the same rate, I believe. Um, maybe slightly less because of the uh, the, uh, the Earth is blocking the is blocking the, uh, but maybe not blocking it so much because the Moon is the Earth is so far away. That's a good question. I don't have a good answer for that. I think it's on average about the same. <clears throat> So, motivation. Why is the moon interesting? Now, the reason I'm doing this is I, I realize I'm peach, preaching to the choir. I don't have to motivate this audience. What I'm really trying to do is I'm motivating people to motivate others. Um, I, when we're talking to people who are not as interested in science, we, we, uh, we should have good arguments as to why science is interesting and why certain subjects are particularly interesting. And also, um, the motivations, even if you are already motivated, the, the, the reasons are, can be still quite interesting. I think we should practice motivating others. And I've grouped it into four, four uh, groups of reasons. OK, why is the moon interesting? Seasons, the moon has affected our seasons, and I'll t talk about that. Uh, tides, uh, there are tides on the Earth, and the moon, and the Earth has induced tides uh, uh, on the Moon. As I said before, there's tidal locking. One face has been locked towards the Earth, uh, and I'll talk about that. Eclipses, you can do interesting science during the eclipses. If you have a solar eclipse where the Moon is blocking the Sun, uh, you can see the corona of the Sun more easily. So you can do science. That's only a short time, though. Only like a Occultations. What that means is the moon will block uh, the view of certain uh, objects in the background, like asteroids. And if you time occultations, um, when an asteroid goes behind the moon and then uh, reappears uh, from different places on the Earth, you can refine its orbital elements um, to the asteroid, for example. The moon has been used in navigation. You can work out your longitude using the moon. Uh, all lunars. Yes, now, but still good to still good to have the old methods. It's an example of a lunar eclipse here. The moon is passing into the 
It's in the penumbra. It hasn't passed into the umbra of the eclipse, and we'll talk about what penumbra and umbra mean later. Uh, you can have a base for exploration, for scientific experiments, for settlements, um, even industrializing the moon. I'll talk about a bit about that later. We can understand the formation and structure of the Earth better. And, of course, the moon has inspired us scientifically, inspired us, uh, inspired us to explore uh, romantically, literarily, artistically, religiously. Of course, well, Easter is defined in terms of, a, of I have an example of being artistically inspired here. This famous painting by Vincent van Gogh. And, yes, that's my terrible pronunciation of Dutch. Uh, I'm sure that's painful to Chantel. My apologies. Uh, Vincent van Gogh sounds a little too anglicized to me. Anyway, so you see the moon. This is the starry night, and here's the moon appearing here. It's a crescent moon. Looks like it's a waning crescent. We'll talk about the phases of the moon later. Let's see. Log messages, I think I have. Ah. Yes, I haven't been following this correctly. Is that crater visible? That's a good question. I'm not sure which side of the, the moon that's on. Uh, I have a, a, a diagram of the moon that I'll show later, of the lunar near side that's labeled. So we'll take a look at that. Uh, so I'm checking my fan mail every now and then. Okay. Lunar basics. Some basics of the moon basic details that we should all know before proceeding. So not surprisingly, the moon has an elliptical orbit. So you can see, I think the uh, eccentricity here has been slightly exaggerated, but you can see that this is, this is the minor axis that I'm indicating here, the minor axis of the orbit. The Earth is at one focal point of the uh, ellipse, and there's the other focal point more or less there. When the moon uh, passes closest to the Earth, that's called... Uh, Perigee, and when it's passed farthest from the Earth, that's apogee along the major axis of the Earth. And the perigee distance will up very slightly because the uh, uh, eccentricity of the ellipse varies. 357,000 kilometers at perigee and something like 406,000 kilometers at apogee. The semi-major axis, this is sort of like the, uh, the average distance of the Moon from the Earth. The semi-major is like half of this distance here, so it's half this distance. 384,000 kilometers, and for those of you who speak American, that's 240,000 miles. This is uh, eccentricity of 0 0.055. That actually varies slightly because of the moon's orbit. The moon is or uh, is perturbed by other bodies in the solar system. Jupiter. The orbital period, I give two orbital periods here, and we'll talk about what those mean later, um, <clears throat> what they mean exactly. The 27.3 days is the sidereal period. That's relative to the distant stars. You can think of them as being fixed on a celestial sphere almost. But a way of defining a coordinate system. In that coordinate system, the moon orbits the Earth in 27.3 days. But to actually go from, say, full moon to full moon, from one from through all its phases, or new moon to new moon, it takes a little longer. It's called the synodic period. That's 29.5 days, and that's because the Earth is going around the sun. Month has gone distance around the sun. So to come back to the same phase, the moon has to go a little further. There's a diagram for that. Well, inclination, 5.1 degrees to the ecliptic. So here's the Earth and moon, obviously not to scale and distance here, but um, here's, let's see, there's the ecliptic, this plane here. This represents the Earth's orbit around the sun. This plane includes the sun. It's called the ecliptic. It's, to a good approximation, the ecliptic of much of the solar system, or the, the, the plane of the solar system. And the moon, you'll notice, orbits in a plane that's only slightly different from the ecliptic, only five degrees off. And that is very interesting, because the overwhelming majority of, of moons in our solar system orbit their planets in their equatorial plane. So for the Earth, let's see, here's the equator here. So you can imagine continuing this plane outwards. The, the moon is not in the, in the equatorial plane of the Earth, which is inclined at 23.4 degrees to the ecliptic. Basically this angle here, this angle here. 
same as the axial tilt, 23.4 degrees. Um, this is called the obliquity of the ecliptic, and it's what determines our seasons. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. That's, that's, that's been affected by the moon. Um, as I said before, it's tidally locked to the Earth. So as a near side and a far side, there is no such thing as a permanent dark side of the moon, uh, with all due respect to Pink Floyd. Um, I will mention a dark side occasionally in this talk, but I'm not talking about a permanent dark side. Any side of the moon will be dark at any given moment. Uh, let's see. Comments? No? Okay. Some more characteristics of the Earth and Moon. The mean radius um, is about one quarter that of Earth. Flattening 0.1%, what that means is the Moon is, is very close to a, a perfect sphere. Its mass is like one eighth of the, uh, one eightieth of the Earth's. The density is about 60% of the Earth's. Surface gravity, as we know, is like one sixth that of Earth's, 1.62 meters per second squared. For, for Earth, that's 9.8 meters per second squared on the Earth's surface. Escape velocity, 2.4 kilometers per second, basically. For the Earth, that's like 11 kilometers per second. That's important because uh, you can use the moon for um, constructing, um, constru uh, you can use the moon for resources, for constructing things in space, and you can launch these things into space very easily because it only takes 1 20th of uh, the escape energy of the Earth. So the escape energy is much lower by a factor of 20. Um, the or rotational period. The rotational period is the same as the orbital period, as I've mentioned before, because it's tidally locked. One faces towards us all the time. Axial tilt, as I mentioned before. Um, for the ecliptic, to its own orbital plane, it's, it's more. The albedo, this is a measure of its reflectivity. If it's one, that reflects all the light back, but it's only 0.136, so the moon is actually has a very dark surface. It appears bright to us because it's the well, it's the largest uh, object in the night sky, extended, um, <clears throat> and it's fairly close to us. So uh, it seems bright to us, but it, it actually absorbs like 86% of it. it's it. Temperature, the uh, surface temperature varies. It's a mean of about 220 kelvins. So 273 kelvins is zero degrees Celsius. It's the freezing point of water. So this is like minus 50 Celsius. Is almost the same in Fahrenheit, that particular temperature. Uh, 100 Kelvin is minus 173 Celsius, which is uh, <clears throat> something like minus 300 Fahrenheit. And it can actually go up to 390 Kelvins. And um, <clears throat> so uh, that's about 120 degrees Celsius, which is above the boiling point of water. The angular diameter, most people are surprised when. when when I say this, you always picture the moon as being somehow very big in the sky, but it's not. It's only half a degree. And you can verify this yourself. You don't have to take my word for it. One finger at arm's length has an angular th thickness of like one to one and a half degrees. So it, it would cover the moon. It would cover the moon like two to three times over. You can try this yourself. S stick your finger up at arm's length, pointing towards the full moon, and see see what it, see how small. Let's see, check my fan mail again. Okay, yeah, it's a really hot sauna. I wouldn't recommend being there without a suit, though. <clears throat> Appropriately attired. Lunar formation and structure. Okay, so let's see, there was a mention of this crater teal. Zielokowski. I, I, it's not labeled here. I don't see it labeled here, but it might actually be on the near side. But okay, so this is, let's see, the crater Copernicus, Kepler, Kepler crater Tycho, which we've anglicized to Tycho. And you can see the, the lunar mare here. These are where lava is welled up on the surface. I'll explain why that happened, or at least give one hypothesis, which seems very likely. So these three, Mar uh, Mare Serenitatis, I've actually, I actually remember this. I don't remember the other features without looking at a diagram. 
Mare, Mare tranquillitatis and Mare fecunditatis. These here, you can think of them actually as sort of the uh, the hand, the hour hand of clock. Yeah. So uh, this is the, from the northern hemisphere. I, ha I have to emphasize oh, this is a northern hemisphere view. So you see this towards the south. When it's at this angle, it looks like it's the, the hour hand is pointing at 10 o'clock. Um, so what you do is you add two hours and you get midnight. So this is when the full moon would be at midnight. So if you actually see them over here, okay, over here, then you can say, oh, this is something like uh, it's four in the morning. If it's over here, maybe six in the morning. So you can use this as a clock. Let's see, or over here. So this is like early evening. Another thing you can do is keep in mind that the moon is is is. Uh, I'm talking about if you see the moon in a photo, you can you can work out the time that the photo was taken. That's what I was getting at. But now you can say, well, if you see the moon in a photo and, and it's half a degree in size, and suppose you see a building here, like that looks like this big here against the moon, so you can figure out how far this photo was taken away from away from the away from the away from the building. If the building is say three uh, three stories high. Each story is about three meters. So the building would be uh, roughly 10 meters high, and say that that would mean that the total moon in this picture would be let's see that's about three times that or maybe four times that. So 30 30 meters high the moon appear would appear in that photo. So 30 times 120 is like three and a half kilometers. So you know you're building that that photo was taken. So one thing is you can are, are the seas caused by meteor impacts? Uh, um. Uh, there have been uh, hypotheses that suggest that that could have happened, that when the moon formed really close to the Earth, the, moon, uh, the Earth somehow focused the, the meteor falls, meteorite, uh, I suppose they'd be called meteorite impacts, onto the uh, surface of the Earth. But uh, no, there's another uh, another mechanism uh, which has to do with the melting of the, uh, melting of the near side, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a little while. So this is um, this is a, a beautiful image, um, not just because of the color scheme. I mean, this is a topographic map. It was done with the uh, the uh, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. They have, this is laser altimetry, so it's very re very precise measurements of of this of the elevation. It goes from plus seven kilometers to minus six kilometers. That's a thirteen kilometer range, which is like two thirds what you find on Earth. Extreme range on Earth is something like 20 kilometers. Zero is like the lunar sea level. Um, there were no seas on 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 the, on the, Mar uh, on, on the moon, but it's it's, uh, it's a term that's used. And these are the lunar seas, which never had water in them, but it was one time believed that they did have water in them. And these are fairly low, at like minus four, minus three kilometers. And then you have you have the lunar highlands, which are higher. They sort of like one kilometer. And the, the main features you see on the moon are the uh, are the lunar seas, uh, the lunar highlands, and of course you see plenty of, of impact crater. Those are the main features to talk about. So formation. Um, this is going to answer Barakon's question. Um, the prevailing hypothesis now is that the Earth-Moon system formed after an impact. Now, this is after, certainly after the Earth formed 4.6 billion years ago. So there's a Mars-sized body. It was called Thea, and that's, again, from Greek mythology. She was the mother of Selene. <clears throat> With the proto-Earth, there was a giant impact. It blasted material into Earth's orbit. So this is what is being depicted here in this artist's um, artist conception. And then the material created and formed the Moon. And some have said that that can explain why the Earth and Moon have similar geology, but it and the Moon have very similar geology, so that might not be sufficient. Maybe what happened was the, uh, the impact with Thea vaporized both of them. Wow. They formed a, a large disk and later accreted to the Earth and the Moon, so that would homogenize everything. Another idea or a variation on this idea. I said before, the far side has a crust that's thicker, about 48 kilometers thicker of the near side. <clears throat> Um, now, why are the near side and far side distinct? 
the explanation here is actually I like the explanation. I don't know if it's going to prove to be true or not. This is this is a hypothesis, so I mean it's not not hasn't been fully confirmed yet. Um, when the Earth and Moon formed, the Moon was much closer than it is now, like supposedly 40 degrees across, so, you know, nearly two orders of magnitude closer than it is now. Now keep in mind that the tides, and I'll talk about the tides, what exactly they are. They go uh, inversely like uh, the distance cubed. So if you reduce the distance by a factor of 10, the tide is 1,000. Back then, it would have been like 40 to 50,000 times stronger than it is now, tidal forces, because the Earth and Moon were so close together. So that, that tidal locking mechanism would have been thousands of times stronger, which locked one face of the Moon towards the Earth and one away from the Earth. But the Earth was molten, about 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit, 2,500, uh, 4,500 Fahrenheit, 2,500 Celsius. This melted the near side of the Moon. So it does sort of like has a melted face. I mean, it, the crust is thinner here, so it did flow elsewhere. So, <clears throat> I mean, this is an, an interesting idea. Why, I, why, why I, it appeals to me is that the tidal locking mechanism is tied to the distinctness of the two faces. Those two go hand in hand. So it does appeal to me. Whether it's right or not, again, time will tell. Uh, I don't think it flowed that far, but that's an interesting question. Um, it would be hard to explain how it would flow uphill. I mean, did the melted near side crust flow to the far side to make it thicker? No, I, I don't see how that could have happened because it would have to have fl flowed uphill. <clears throat> Uh, the melting might have deformed the moon in some way. It would have been a, a very uh, traumatic event for the moon if it had been alive. Okay, structure. <clears throat> so we see a structure here. This is um, similar to the Earth. I mean, in the Earth, you have a solid iron inner core and a fluid iron outer core. And this is done, of course, because there were seismometers placed on the moon. There's no real geological activity on the moon, but there are impacts which can for barrier structures similar to that of the Earth, solid and rich inner core, fluid outer core, and this partially molten boundary here. Um, <clears throat> crystallization of the magma ocean would have created a mantle from the precipitation and sinking of silicate minerals. When I say silicate minerals, keep in mind I'm not a geologist, so I've oversimplified what I did uh, in an article. They were talking about pyroxene and olivine and different uh, types of silicate minerals. Um, I strongly recommend that we have a geologist speak to us about the moon someday. Talking about. The volcanic surface features, these include the uh, lunar maria and the uh, lunar highlands. Okay. Is, it is deformed, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, <clears throat> the moon does seem to be deformed uh, in a very large, in a very large scale sense. Okay, the lunar mare, dark and relatively featureless lunar plains, maria. Singular, the singular is mare. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing it. Once believed to be filled with water, but there is no water, of course. Oh, well, there's a bit of water towards the poles, uh, frozen ice, fro water ice in the. Uh, there are vast pools of basaltic lava. These, these are similar to terrestrial basalts. As I said, there are a lot of similarities between the Earth and Moon that suggest that the Moon came from the Earth. But they have a bit more iron and no minerals wa altered by water. And these lavas erupted or flowed into the depressions associated with the impact. Almost all of these mare are on the near side. They cover 35 or 1 percent of the near side, and only 2 percent of the far side. This sort of looks like a lunar mare. It looks like more than 2 percent. Maybe it's not a mare. See mare. I keep repeating this image because I really like this image here. <clears throat> Lunar highlands. Okay, lighter colored regions, and I mean lighter colored in the naked eye, not 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 the, not this this colored image. They're called terai or highlands. 
because they're higher than most Maria. They've been radiometric, radiometrically dated. Um, that's one reason why the lunar missions have been important. We know a lot more about the moon now than we did because we actually have samples of moon rocks that we can uh, we can date and do other experiments on. So we know more about the moon and more about how the uh, Earth evolved and how the moon formed. And they may represent cumulates of, of basically feldspar, different kinds of feldspar. In contrast to Earth, uh, none of these, uh, none of the major mountains were formed by plate tectonics. I don't think there is anything like plate tectonics on the Moon. And impact craters, um, as I mentioned before, this is this is uh, the Tycho from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. It's a big crater. It's something like I guess it's like 90 kilometers across. This image is 120 kilometers across. Okay, they formed when asteroids or comets, or comets collide with the lunar surface. And they're roughly 300,000 larger than one kilometer from the moon's near side alone. And the lunar ge geological time scale is based on major impact events, Nectaris, Imbrium, Oriental. Multiple rings of uplifted material. I mean, one reason I like this image here because it shows what's called central uplift. And, of course, there's uplift in, ring, in the ring here. And this happens because these high energy impacts turn the rock into a, like a viscous fluid. Not exactly, uh, not exactly liquid, but it flows and it splashes around. So you have, it looks like a splash frozen in time. Lack of atmosphere means you have lack of weather. Uh, the lack of recent geological processes. So these crater craters are well preserved. And um, after the period of heavy bombardment, which happened like 4.6 billion years ago, and apparently another period mentioned down here, um, after that, there was a nearly constant rate of craters forming. And that can be used to estimate the age of the surface, which can be checked with radi radiometric aging. So there was another period of uh, heavy bombardment about 4 billion years ago. Check my fan mail again. Oh, that's an interesting. Yeah, Baragon brings up an interesting point. <clears throat> Planets are uh, the definition that um, for a planet now is that you have a body that's uh, uh, rigid body forces are overcome by gravity to give you a roughly spherical shape, uh, oblate spheroid. And the planet also has to. Uh, yeah, no Disney characters. That's right. And the planet also has to have cleared its orbit. So if the planet has moons, will that help it clear the orbit a little faster? That's an interesting point. I hadn't thought about that. I would guess it might. And I show this image again because I'm really impressed by it. There's a lot of a lot of beautiful data here. Yeah, that's an interesting structure. Is that a, is that a mare? Okay. Moons orbit about the Earth. Or I just said lunar orbit, but that's a little ambiguous. I'm talking about the moon orbiting around the Earth. So I have this. This I copied from Wikipedia. Okay, so here's the Earth. And let's see, I got stuff in the way here. Okay, and here's the moon. And see, this is to scale. The distance and the sizes are to scale. So you can see they're separated by quite a bit compared to their sizes which is actually quite remarkable when you think about it, because the moon raises very high tides on the Earth, many meters. Yeah, we live in Horseshoe Bay, and when I'm in Canada, uh, I live in Horseshoe Bay a few months of the year, and uh, that's in West Vancouver. The tides there range from low to high, of like two and a half to three meters, or about eight to ten feet. And this is done by this body here, way out here. So actually quite remarkable. <clears throat> There another another theory. Meanwhile, another theory for what? How the how the moon formed? I think that's the best theory for the uh, for the moment. The best hypothesis, I prefer to say. But again, time will tell. So yeah, I like this diagram as well because it really shows the, the, how far apart they are in terms of their sizes. Okay, so this diagram will take a little bit of explaining, and I think it's important because we're talking about the phases of the moon. What are the phases of the moon? 
we go from new moon to new moon in this diagram and as you, as we go from new moon to moon new moon uh, and we're going through full moon here we go from new moon to full moon to new moon again the point we're making is that there are two motions here the sun is up here these are the rays from the sun okay and our viewpoint is like we're attached to um, the, the distant stars and we're looking back so we're in a coordinate system that's not ro uh, ro revolving with the earth around the sun so there's two movements there's a the movement of the earth around the sun okay? and there's also the movement of the moon around the earth there are two and so it's a complicated dance of three bodies okay and the phase of the moon is simply the si uh, is simply the uh, represented by the fraction of the side towards us, the lunar near side, that is illuminated by the sun. At new moon, which is this part right here, we uh, we don't see the moon. Um, I guess you could see the moon under proper conditions, but it's pretty dark. The dark side that's towards us is the, lo the lunar near side, as always. <clears throat> Then when you go to what's called waxing crescent, that's over here, you can see that the sun, this visible from Earth, we can see at least part of the lunar near side, part of its. Then we come over here to um, where you see that the moon and the Earth are at right angles with the sun. The sun is at right, or the moon's at right angles with the sun as far as the Earth is concerned. This is called the first quarter. So the new moon, waxing crescent first quarter and then we have waxing gibbous which is all gibbous you can check some dictionaries and here you get waxing gibbous because the, uh, the moon has moved over here you can see most of the near side now most of the illuminated near side full moon of course is fully illuminated by the sun. near side is fully illuminated by the sun. then that's the, the Phases repeat in the waning sense, waning gibbous, wane, last quarter, waning crescent, and then new moon. But if you look at this orientation here, when the moon returns to this particular orientation with respect to the distant stars, then it's completed one sidereal orbit. And that's, well, that's almost here, not quite. But, in order, but you can see that the moon is now not in the same place with respect to the sun and earth. The sun's over here, earth here, but the moon is not there in order to be a new moon. To be a new moon, it has to be on this line. So it takes longer for it to come back to new moon position than in the sidereal sense. So this is called the synodic period. So to go from new moon to new moon, it takes longer than to complete one orbit in the sidereal sense. Now there are two things I want to add to that. One is this difference between the synodic period and the sidereal period also applies to the Earth rotating. The Earth rotates, of course, in 24 hours. But as it does so, it doesn't go very far, but it does move around the sun a bit. So that means that the Earth's surface is being illuminated from a different angle. And so we can now see that the solar day is actually slightly longer than the sidereal day. Well, about four minutes longer and that's important because we have what's called the apparent solar day and that actually changes as the earth goes around the sun because it goes at different speeds at different times of the year because it's a, not a completely circular orbit so the apparent solar day varies very slightly and we want a more accurate clock or a more uniform clock so we don't use apparent solar time we use what's called mean solar time called mean time which is an averaged out version of apparent solar time. And very specifically, what we use is the mean time at the standard longitude that is closest to us, and that's called standard time. And we're using daily savings time, which is just a variation of that, where you add an hour. <clears throat> Another thing I want to point out is that if you'll notice, the moon it seems to be in front, of, uh, in front of the Earth here, so why isn't it blocking the light from the sun? Here, why isn't the Earth blocking the light towards the moon? Can you have eclipse, an eclipse every month? And the answer is no, because again, the moon is orbiting in a different plane from the Earth's orbit. 
around the sun, five degrees out of the plane. And the intersection of those two planes, called the line of node, it won't necessarily point at the sun, but sometimes it will point at the sun. And when it does, you can have an eclipse if the moon is in the right position. So this has been a long-winded explanation. I hope you're able to follow that. Let's see. Okay, no comments so far, I guess, for what I can see. Okay. So here's a diagram to demonstrate eclipses a little better. I like this diagram. This came from Stack Overflow. Let's see. So it's this this big plane here. This is the ecliptic. As the Earth goes around the Sun, this is the orbit of the Earth around the Sun. And you can see that here's the Moon's orbit. The Moon's orbital plane is distinct from the ecliptic plane. And this has probably been exaggerated a bit. It's not that big a difference. But if you have, okay, and here's the what's called the line of nodes. Okay. This is the intersection between the two planes. If this line of nodes is not pointing at the Sun, then you can see that the Earth does not block the Moon when the moon is full. And the moon, if the moon is new, it does not block the Earth. It does not block the light from the, from the sun. But as the, as the moon and Earth orbit around the sun, you can have this line of nodes, this line of, of intersection between the two planes pointing at the sun. And then you will have either a lunar eclipse, or in this case it's a solar eclipse, or a lunar eclipse if the moon is in the right place when that line of nodes is pointing at the sun. So this is this is actually quite simple conceptually. I mean, a lot of astronomy, especially nearby astronomy in the solar system, is, is geometry rather. Than... Um, eclipse shadows, as I've mentioned before, they have a, an umbra and a penumbra, and the umbra is the darker inner part, and the penumbra is the lighter outer part. Um, there's a difference because the sun is not a point source; it's extended. So an observer standing in the penumbra would still see part of the sun. He would see a, a partial eclipse. But if he's in the dark inner part, he would not see the sun at all, even though it's extended. So a new moon or full moon can result in an eclipse, but only if you have a certain alignment. It doesn't have to be a perfect alignment. And we'll talk a bit more about eclipses because they are interesting. Let's see, I did have the or this the other way around, I thought. Let me see. Yeah, here it is. I'll go back to the super moon in a minute. I seem to have, have them out of order. So here's a lunar eclipse. Um, it's not quite a total eclipse yet because the moon hasn't reached the penumbra. And this is not to and this is not to scale. The sun would be further away uh, based on its size here. But when it passes into the umbra, you have a total eclipse when it's in the penumbra. And again, this penumbra, you have only partial eclipses, as you can see part of the sun. Lunar eclipses occur from two to five times a year, although they're not always total eclipses. They're not total. And total, remember, is when the moon is completely in the umbra. And during total eclipses, the moon is bathed in a dark red light, sometimes called the blood red, because of our association of the moon with horror movies due to refraction through the Earth's atmosphere. And this is why sunsets, I mean, this is the same reason why sunsets are, are on Earth are red. Refraction in the atmosphere, scattering as well. So a lunar observer, if you imagine that you're standing on the lunar surface, you would see a bright red ring encircling the Earth. And this is the Earth's atmosphere. You would see the Earth's atmosphere if you were standing on the moon during a total lunar eclipse. Then there's a total, then there's what's called the uh, solar eclipse, where the moon's cast its shadow on the Earth. And these can occur like two to three times per year, though not necessarily over land. So cruise ships that actually eclipse cruises. And these can be of any th of these three types. There's a partial eclipse, where it never becomes a, a total eclipse. And there's a total eclipse where you can see the, you can see the sun's corona, the outer gas, the sun. But you can also have an annular annular eclipses occur because uh, the Earth's orbit is elliptical, the Moon's orbit is elliptical, so you can have the angular size of the Moon less than that of the Sun. So you can see a thin ring of the Sun's pho photosphere here. Let's see any questions here? No questions, no comments. Okay, this, maybe I've just missed them. Let me check back. Okay. 
Uh, okay. Yeah. I, when you touch the screen, that fills this box, so that makes it difficult. Let's see. Okay. Sorry, I've been missing comments because there's so many. Uh, there's so many uh, messages in the in the in the box that uh, say slide presentation touched, which is distracting me from the comments. I did my undergrad at university at the tip of the Bay of Fundy. Incredible ties. Yes, the Bay of Fundy. That's an excellent point. The Bay of Fundy has a, a particular natural resonance, so the tides are apparently like 20 meters high, so that's like 70 uh, 70 feet high. Absolutely incredible. I really like that slide. I wish <laughs> I knew which slide that was. Maybe it's the one with the with the, uh, the planes. Okay. Uh, Okay, so not that the uh, I'm not sure what not that means. We're in a biplanetary system. Yeah, you could think of the Earth and the Moon as a biplanetary system because the Moon is actually fairly large compared to the Earth. I believe the composition of the Moon suggested is related to the Earth and not captured by the Earth. Yeah, that's 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 definitely a good point. Um, but uh, capturing it's not easy to capture one body from another. I mean, if it comes in. With enough, um, if it was free, uh, free body, and then it gets into, it can't get into orbit around another body without losing kinetic energy. And there are ways that can happen, like if you have collisions, or if it's a three body, uh, three body interaction. Um, so in order to get the Thea and uh, get the Earth and the Moon so similar, you need them to be um, homogenized by by the interaction. Um, there's at least some believe that. Uh, I wonder if when the moon was closer, there was a time when there was an eclipse every month. Um, yeah, well, when the moon's 40 degrees in size, of course, there was nothing alive on the surface of that time, uh, on the surface of the Earth at that time. But the moon has moved outwards. Some have said that it's an interesting coincidence that the moon and the sun have the same angular size. But uh, if you went back uh, like a billion years or so, the moon was had a larger angular size, and in the future it'll have a smaller angular size. So we're just living in a privileged age, I guess. Let's see what else we got? Ten meters? Oh, I don't know. Uh, I think the yeah, that's uh, that's a good question, Mike. I, I think the Bay of Fundy has tides that are, are actually twenty meters high. The moons grinding into each other. Okay. Oh yes, that's yeah, that's you're right. There is another hypothesis that uh, suggests that a couple of moons were formed and that they ended up they ended up um, uh, coalescing. <clears throat> but yeah, I mean, someone can check that on the web. The Bay of Fundy's tides. I think they're actually. I think they are actually. Uh, oh, but wait a minute. No, you're actually from near there, as I recall. These tides. Let's just do a quick check. Tidal ranges up to 40 feet, so that's 12 meters. Okay, yeah, so it's closer to what you said than what I said. I had that, I'd understood it to be like 20 meters, but okay. I stand corrected. Okay, supermoon, going back one. What exactly is the supermoon? And you can see here, let's see, they have the full moon at perigee or the full moon at apogee, and you can see that the angular size is, is noticeably different. So if you have a full moon at perigee, I mean, the sun is over here. Okay, and the sun's light's coming in this way. Here's the new moon at apogee. So as I said, if you well, if you have the major axis of the moon's orbit pointing towards the sun, and the apogee is over here away from the sun, then you can have a full moon at perigee, and that's basically what the supermoon is. Okay, tides. The concept of tides is not really that difficult to understand. It's basically differential gravitational force. Um, <clears throat> the force of gravity falls off like one over distance squared, which means that it gets weaker with distance, which means there's a gradient in that force, which means that the near side of a body that is pulled more is more pulled more strongly by its orbiting partner than the far side. So the moon on the Earth and vice versa. This pulls both bodies into egg-like shapes. 
So I have a diagram here, which I don't entirely like because it doesn't show the moon as being bulging, and the moon does actually bulge. It has its own tides, and that's important because it led to tidal locking. What happens is the moon's gravity pulls on this side of the Earth strongly than it pulls pulls more strongly at the center than it pulls on the far side, and that stretches out the earth. And because oceans, water flows very easily, you see clearly in, in ocean, uh, produces, produces waves on land. So that's why you get the tides. But the interesting thing is, as they show in this diagram, which is one reason why I do like the diagram, is it shows uh, the offset of the bulges from the Earth-Moon line. So you have the Earth-Moon line here, but the tidal bulges are offset from that, and that's because of the Earth's rotation, which is faster than the Moon's orbit uh, around the Earth, faster than the Moon's uh, revolution about the Earth. So this bulge leads the Moon, and it pulls on the Moon. And by pulling on the moon, what it's doing is it's pulling it into a, a wider orbit. Sort of like if you have a dance partner and you're twirling around with a dance partner and your arms are stretchy, then they'll stretch away from you. Similar idea. Of course, the moon's orbit is uh, in the prograde, prograde sense as, as the Earth's orbit. Otherwise, it would be pulling the moon inwards. That's why the moon was very close to begin with. Uh, when the moon was, uh, after the moon formed, apparently the, yeah, the days on Earth were much shorter than they are now because the moon is pulling back on the, on the tidal bulge of the Earth, which is slowing the Earth's rotation. So about every 1.7 milliseconds uh, every century is, is how the Earth's rotation is slowing. The days are slowly getting longer as the moon slowly moves outwards at about 4 centimeters per year. Another way to think of this is that the uh, spin angular momentum of the Earth is being transferred to the Moon's orbital angular momentum. Okay. So yeah, will, will the Earth actually stand still and won't rotate anymore? And we're talking about a very long time in the future, probably um, long after the Earth has been destroyed by the Sun. I don't think that'll happen before something else bad happens, which isn't very comforting. Now, tidal locking. I'm sure the suspense has been killing you. So what exactly is tidal locking? So you have one lunar face is towards us on the Earth. And remember that the moon is also pulled into an egg shape by tidal forces. Now, if the moon were rotating with respect to the Earth-Moon line, that egg-shaped bulging that we that uh, is there would move around throughout the moon's interior, and this would generate heat because of internal friction. So that heat is, has dissipated the moon's rotational kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is the energy of movement, resulting in its currently tidally locked state. And I have an analogy here which is not perfect, because human body heat can also do the same thing, but if you roll a rubber ball around between your hands and you flatten that ball while doing so, the ball heats up as internal friction dissipates the kinetic energy from your hands. And this is similar to what's happened with the moon's rotation. Tidal bulging. Uh, yeah, things are getting a little late, but I think I'll be finished soon. Um, the moon stabilizes the rotational axis of the Earth. This is an important point. The moon is in a, a relatively stable orbit in the long term anyway. It pulls on the Earth's equatorial bulge. The, moon is not, the Earth is not perfectly spherical. Thereby by keeping the Earth's rotational axis from wanding too far while it precesses. Tops precess. Let's imagine you have a spinning top. We've Many of us have played with tops when we were kids. They teach physics, so they're the toy I approve of. So if you have a spinning top and it's extra wide, another way to say that is it has higher angular, has higher uh, moment of inertia, it tends to be more stable because it's more resistant to uh, perturbations, specifically um, perturbational torques that are perpendicular to the axis. 
So you can imagine that the Earth spinning by itself is like a narrow top, but if you have the Moon orbiting it, it's suddenly a wider top. The Moon, in a way, is connected, physically connected to the Earth by a gravity. It's not rigidly connected, but it's connected by gravity. And this keeps the obliquity of the ecliptic confined to a fairly narrow range, from about 22 degrees to about 24 and a half degrees. And this minimizes seasonal extremes, making the Earth more suitable for life. And this is Easter, of course, on the Gregorian calendar. So I thought this was uh, this is a, a pretty cool algorithm. Jean Mias writes these astronomical algorithms um, books. Uh, I strongly recommend this book if you are interested in, in such algorithms. So it's the first day of the first Sunday after the first full moon that occurs on or after the March equinox. So you can have Easter anywhere between 22 March and 25 April. And there's a simple method. It doesn't may not look simple, but I mean there are many steps. Yes, but each each step is actually quite simple. It's just division, division, and yeah, there's some addition and subtraction. And what's actually rather amazing to me is that this simple algorithm with each of these simple steps actually has embedded within it implicitly the phases of the moon as well as the Julian calendar. <clears throat> Determining the phases of the moon is not really that simple. I mean, it's com complex in its entirety, I suppose, but it's uh, representing a rather complex physical process. And at the end, you get two numbers. You get an N and you get a P, and they give you the number of the month and the day of the month. And they give you a series of dates that um, from year to year. And that series of dates is actually a pattern because it repeats after 5.7 million years. For the calendar, for the Julian calendar, Two years, 5.7 million years is so. Uh, so, let's see, and mail again. Let's see what we got here. Let's see. <laughs> yes, there's a drop. Less deep uh, sky stargazing because of the moon. That's that's true. Um, even for us professional astronomers, the ones who do optical astronomy, I'm, I'm a radio astronomer. Um, uh, I have done a bit of optical, not much. But, um, yeah, I mean, when you're putting in your observing proposal, what you say is uh, on the nights that you want to observe, I mean, is, is the moon going to be a problem for what you're doing? Uh, for some people, that is a problem. Uh -huh. Yes. Um, yeah. Good point, Baragon. <clears throat> What's the the date that Jesus actually rose? I think a lot of the stuff that's written in the Bible was written hundreds of years afterwards, so that's that's uh, that's um, not straightforward. So yeah, that's that's appropriate for today talking about this al uh, algorithm. Um, yeah, I strongly recommend this book if you are interested in such algorithms. He ex he explains the algorithms. Um, he explains how to do the algorithms very well. Doesn't explain why they work though, which would have made the book much thicker. Missions to the moon. I'm not going to say much about these because you know, I mean there's, there's just <laughs> so many of them. I mean this is you know a list that I got from Wikipedia and this is only one page. Each of these pages has like uh, 30 30 missions, so they're like uh, 120 missions in total that have been to the moon. You can see, yeah, see, this is mostly in these early days. This is Russia and uh, U.S. And this one's important, of course, Apollo 11. First uh, human being on the, on the surface of the moon. And, I mean, there's, there's, just, there's just so much information here. Let's see, China's involved. Let's see, uh, India. Israel, um, space, and future proposed mission, uh, uh, missions, North Korea, that one worries me a bit, China, maybe not as much, Japan, doesn't worry me, and of course Russia and the U.S., these proposed missions in the future, I mentioned Falcon 9 in some of these, so I think it's going to involve SpaceX, so there'll be uh, more private uh, missions in the future. 
So I'm not going to go through all this. I only cut and pasted this just to show that, you know, there's a lot to talk about. I, I strongly recommend that we get someone giving a talk about lunar missions, someone who's qualified to talk about lunar missions. They have been important because, as I said before, we understand better the formation uh, of the moon. And also because uh, the astronauts have left instruments there, like corner cubes, collecting um, corner cubes. Actually measure the distance of the moon. So those corner cubes. Manned lunar missions. So many of those. Future of the humanity and the moon. So this is particularly interesting. This is the uh, let's see, LOP gateway, lunar orbital pathway. This is a, a space station, and you can see it's going to be an, an orbit around the moon. Okay, and I think this is particularly exciting. International crew, of course, do interesting science there. Communications hub, human, human access to and from the lunar surface. Will we colonize the moon and have industries on the moon? A station like this could help and a hub for further de destinations to help us spread across the uh, solar system. So this is American-led, NASA proposed. It involves um, other countries, as usual. Um, habitation module, holding area for rovers and robots. Interesting sciences, planetary science, astrophysics, Earth observations, heliophysics, fundamental space biology. That could be pretty exciting. Human health and performance. Uh, staging crew for long-term missions. This is a shakedown mission prior to the first crewed mission to Mars. And yeah, don't worry, I'm almost finished here. I realize I'm running over. I'm sorry for that. Colonizing and industrializing the moon. I use this video. Uh, some of you may have heard of Isaac Arthur. He has a channel on YouTube. I strongly recommend his videos. He talks about things like colonization of space, the future of space. Um, he also talks about certain scientific, scientific um, science fiction concepts to see how realistic they are, like uh, phasers and uh, electric shield <clears throat> and other things like building habitats, for example. My son recommended this video. He's a real fan. Hold on, talking about the moon in, in circle, and he suggested I uh, as a source of information. And he was right. It was quite interesting. If you watch these videos, you have to watch them like two or three times to get all the information. It's just they're just so dense with information. Anyway, inhabiting the moon, building colonies is easy because of the low surface gravity. So you can cover craters or lava tubes with domes, and you can create large city habitats fairly easily. And you have plenty of building material, iron, aluminum, titanium, for construction. It's easy to remove uh, move resources to and from the lunar surface. As I said, it's got 20 times less escape energy, so it's, it's so, so easy to move things back and forth. You can have a linear mass drivers. These are electromagnetic, electromagnetic ra rails that shoot buckets of material into space, so you can build... Spaceships, space colonies, like the O'Neill colonies, those are particularly fast. Um, there's large rotating cylinders, kilometers in size, their own weather inside because uh, ex they can support space exploration and exploitation, like mining the asteroids. And the lunar far side would be ideal for radio astronomy, uh, ra radio astronomy because it's free from... Uh, Interference from human beings. Yay, radio astronomy. Yes. Okay. And dangerous biological experiments far from other living things. So that's an important point. So <clears throat> um, we can use the moon to help us spread uh, across the stars, um, spread across the solar system, and then eventually the stars. And I'll give the last word to Percy Shelley with Vincent in the background. To the moon, art thou pale for weariness of climbing heaven and gazing on the earth, wandering companionless among the stars that have a different birth and ever changing like a joyless eye that finds no object worth its constancy. So maybe in the near future, 
perhaps in the near future the moon will feel less lonely as we humans spread across it and across the stars. I thank you for your time and for your interest. I'll hang around a bit for questions. <laughs> we are unworthy of the moon, okay. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I ran a little late. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, maybe I was facing the wrong way. I wasn't looking at my avatar. Silly me. Yeah, I expanded the screen. Made it sure it was nice and big. Yep. Rare metals? Oh, rare earth elements. Yes, there are rare earth elements on the moon. Yes. So it could be an um, important resource for rare earth elements, which apparently are important for electronics, for example. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Your calendar, yeah. Yeah, there are actually 13 full moons per year, so we'd have 13, 13 months. Neodymium from Agnes, that's a good point, yes. There's something called, uh, let's see, there are deposits of something called creep, which is K-R-E-E-P. The K is for potassium, the R-E-E -E is rare earth elements, and P is for phosphorus. Should there be life on... Uh, um, I think there would be life, but maybe not the kind of life we know now, because as I said before, the the moon has made the Earth um, a much more pleasant place to live for life. But you know, if things were more extreme, there'd probably be s certain life forms that could could live on the Earth still. <laughs> no Easter without the moon, yeah. Thank you. If you want me to do this again, I'm willing to do this on a Saturday. Maybe more people can show up, especially if it's not a, it's not Easter. But of course, this is being recorded anyway, so people can watch that. Tagline couldn't make it. Yeah, sure, after September. Might have my celestial orbits talk done by then. Oh, that's that's an that's an interesting point. Space elevator from the. They've been talking about um, if with the proper new materials we could build a space ele elevator from the Earth. And uh, that would be uh, that would extend quite far, and that would be uh, that would be uh, an interesting way of getting to space. Now, if you did it on the moon, there are the advantage, of course, is that you don't have the same gravity. But the point is, it would have to be much longer because you want to reach the the, um, the synchronous point in the orbits, where the that uh, synchronous point, um, the orbital frequent the period of the orbit is equal to the rotation period of the body. For Earth, that distance is. 38,000 um, 38, kilometers. On the moon, it's, it's much further away because of the, uh, the long rotation period. But yeah. Jeez. Well, it would um, have to be a geo, geosynchronous orbit. You want to have it go to the geosynchronous orbit and actually beyond because you need a counterweight. So it would be, um, it would, uh, <clears throat> it would, on Earth it would extend, I don't know, I don't know if it has to extend twice as far, but maybe it has to extend like twice as far to the geosynchronous point, which is like 30, 36,000, 38,000 kilometers, which is, uh, the orbital period would be 24 hours, identical to the Earth's rotation rate.
Yes, it is easier to build on the moon. As I said, um, you can build large structures, large domes, and that, that, that would be quite interesting, having large cities on the moon. It would be easy to do that. But the space elevator, as I said, there, there's, there are trade-offs in using the moon instead of the Earth. The space elevator would have to reach very far, so it would have to be very, very long indeed. You wouldn't have to have materials quite as strong for us as you would for the elevator on Earth, but the space elevator on the Earth would be shorter. Um, I don't see that that's a problem, Baragon. Um, if you have the moon moving around the Earth, the point is the space elevator would be orbiting with it. Just like if we build a space elevator uh, from the Earth, it's going around the sun, just like the Earth is going around. So I, I don't see that as a big problem. Yeah, that's that's good. That's a good point, Mike. If you had the moon rotating faster, the space elevator wouldn't have to be quite as long. This. Yeah, the space elevator, okay, it starts on the Earth's surface, but it extends into space. I mean, there was a, yeah, there was Arthur C. Clarke story about that. It was interesting. It's a rotating structure that actually came down to the Earth, and the other end was way out beyond the geosynchronous orbit. But, um, <clears throat> yeah, it goes from the surface of the Earth up to the geosynchronous orbit, and it has a counterweight on the other side, so it has to be, like, nearly twice as long as that, so it would extend out to like 70,000. Um, no, not if you, that's why I said if it's a geosynchronous orbit, so you have the center of mass of this massive uh, elevator would have to be at the geosynchronous, in the geosynchronous orbit. So it would be, um, it would be, uh, it would be stationary with respect to the surface of the Earth. Okay, the moon is not, now, now we're talking about something else. There are two distinct things I'm talking about here. One of them is that we're talking about the space elevator from the Earth. And that has nothing to do with the moon. Um, then there's a space elevator from the moon. Space elevator for the moon, like I said, would have to be much more. Um, Oh, an elevator to the moon. <laughs> no, I don't know how you would do that. I, I, I don't even I don't, I don't even have a conception for how you would do that. Um, yeah, connects Earth to moon. That would be pretty cool if you could do that. But I'm talking about... Oh, my voice is breaking up. Yeah, I'm not sure what I can do about that. Um, is it okay now? But, um, okay. Yeah, the, uh, the, I'm talking about two separate uh, uh, space elevators, one from the surface of the Earth and one from the surface of the Moon. And both of those are very useful because you can use the, um, the counterweight at the far end of the uh, elevator can be used to launch things into space because it's going faster than it needs to be going to stay in orbit. So it can be used to launch uh, ships. This is a voice activated. I'm not sure. Yeah, that's true. You could you could use yeah, you wouldn't even need you would only need um rockets to help you or you need engines to help you steer, but most of the thrust would could come from the space elevator itself. As you go beyond the geosynchronous point into that long counterweight as I've mentioned, um you would be going faster than you need to stay in orbit and you could be flung outwards. Your your ship could be flung outwards and uh, that could help you go to the moon for example. <laughs> yes, there are tidal uh, effects on my voice. Okay. Yes, that would be scary if the tide affected my voice. All day? Um, not today. <laughs> I have a bit of a sore throat, so I couldn't talk all day today, but <clears throat> I could certainly talk for longer if necessary. I'm afraid of what you have in mind. As a lunatic, yes. 
uh, yeah, what do you call a clock on the moon? A lunar tick. Yeah, they're pretty terrible. Those jokes are pretty terrible. Okay, Mike. Bon appétit. Or as we say here, buen provecho. Number two. Thank you, Chantal. So what should I do with the screen? Should I just leave it here or um, you, add, you add it to a, a collection? Yeah, thanks, Shadow. Yeah, I, I did read or that uh, briefly. It seems a little bit convoluted why you need a biplanetary, bilunar um, hypothesis to explain things. But yeah, it, it came out of somewhere, so I suppose there are some observational experimental details that require it. Yes, I know how to take it back. I'm, I just, if you want to, uh, if someone else wants to keep it, they can do that too. Let's see. So I already have a copy in my inventory. Okay, a view of me from behind. Okay. Yes, I can. I can email you that. I can email you a, a PDF file. Or I, I I didn't do this in PowerPoint. I did this in LibreOffice. So that's free. Uh, I can give it to you in LibreOffice if you like. Yeah, okay, an amalgam. Um, there was supposedly a third body involved, but as I said before, one possibility is that that interaction destroyed all the body, and, or destroyed the two. And if it destroyed the two, then you, uh, it basically homogenized the whole, the whole system. So yeah, I'll uh, I'll have a PDF version of the talk as well as the uh, as well as uh, the LibreOffice version as well. Um. Okay. The, the cataclysmic event. Okay. That, okay. This produced the Chicxulub crater and caused the um, the massive uh, extinction at the end of the Cretaceous period. That was um, that was not a particularly large body. Um, it was, uh, I believe, something like 10 kilometers across, and uh, so it wouldn't have had a strong effect on the moon other than um, creating a large impact crater. So it wouldn't have had a big effect on the moon. It's it's not that large as far as um, uh, planets or moons are concerned. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I think there are there's uh, trace gases, and they're talking about let's see, pico bars of pressure, and our Earth's what is it for the Earth? It's like one bar or something. So it's yeah, it's, it's many orders of magnitude down in pressure from the from the Earth. <clears throat> I 
Kepler. You can cook anywhere. Just need a, uh, just need a little stove, and you can cook anywhere. But I know what you mean. Yes, our bodies would cook on the moon if we uh, were in the direct sun without uh, a protective suit. Um, yeah, there's a documentary series on National Geographic. It was uh, called One, One Strange Rock. And you had Will Smith as the narrator. It was an interesting uh, series of documentaries. So it's on, it was on Netflix, as a matter of fact. And it talks about how the what life would be like if we didn't have the atmosphere protecting us. Okay, yeah, that's true. I mean, um, I'm not sure if the grinding. Yeah, the grinding would give you a greater homogenization of material without necessarily having as big an impact. On the other hand, it becomes a little more complicated when you have more bodies involved. <laughs> yeah, okay. That's, okay, well, if, as someone says that we've never been to the moon. Uh, yeah, okay. Well, I mean, there, there's... Um, if you believe that... I mean, people like that tend not to be very logical. Um, they can be extremely intelligent, there's no question. You can find people like that who are very intelligent, who have weird views. Uh, but, you know, they believe what they want because they cherry-pick the data. Um, is there evidence? I mean, scientists here can prove that uh, the human beings have gone to the moon because there have been uh, corner, uh, corner reflectors on the moon, moon that uh, reflect back laser beams. And we can, we can see that. And the corner reflectors had to get there somehow. Been there unless it's done with a uh, robotic mission, but would have been obvious too. Collisions are common in space. No, they're not that common in space. Actually, it's uh, even in the asteroid belt, which uh, there aren't that many collisions that often. Um, the, for example, on the moon, if you look at the moon, how often do we see um, impacts on the moon? When they do occur. I mean, they're common in the sense that you could have micrometeorites happening, um, but not not that common in the sense that they would be visible to the naked eye. Because if you have the occasional impact on the moon where you see a flash of light on the moon, that has happened. And uh, last time that something like that was visible, I believe, was like a few centuries ago. So the collisions are common in the sense that if you have tiny tiny particles like sand grains, uh, you can see meteors coming into the Earth's atmosphere, and these are usually size of sand grains, yeah. Um, those are fairly common. But major collisions where you have bodies that are meters in size, that's those aren't very common. Yes, I, I noticed that in the uh, in the green waves above my avatar that uh, my, my voice stopped. Ah, yes, sir. <laughs> Yes, that's a good point. More about colliding than not grinding. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I don't know if the if the uh, the impacts would be more common on the far side than on the near side. I don't think so. I don't see any reason why that would be. Yeah, good question. I'm hoping that uh, climate change won't destroy our civilization. And if it doesn't, then maybe uh, within the next couple decades we'll have we'll have settlements on the moon. Yeah, on our side of the moon. Yeah, I, I don't know if there would be any higher rate of collisions on the far side than the near side. I think it would be about the same. Bye.
supply casts. Yeah, I think I should. Oh, I'm glad the recording went well. I should probably check it out. And see, yeah, see, see my avatar facing the wrong way. Ich, ich spreche Deutsch nicht. Ich habe gelernt Deutsch. That was a long time ago. Ah, uh, thanks for the correction. Look, oh, see, oh, yeah, kind Deutsch. Ich spreche kein Deutsch. Okay, thanks for coming. And look forward to seeing you again.